Okay, this is the third lecture of the metric spaces part of A2. And we're going to elaborate a little bit more in this lecture on the notion of a norm, which I mentioned in the second lecture in connection with the Euclidean norm on R to the N. So let's define what a norm is in generality. So suppose you have a vector space V, it doesn't have to be a finite dimensional vector space, um, then a function denoted by these vertical bars, so a norm function from V to the positive real line is called a norm if the following are all true. So first of all, the norm of X is zero if and only if X is zero. The norm respects scalar multiplication in the sense that the norm of lambda times X is the absolute value of lambda times the norm of X for all scalars lambda in the reals and X in the V. And the norm of x plus y is bounded above by norm of x plus the norm of y whenever x and y lie in v. So well, let's just have a quick look at that. So yeah, the, the definition of a norm on a vector space. So we showed last time that when v is r to the n, the Euclidean norm, the familiar Euclidean norm, is indeed a norm. Um, it fairly obviously satisfies the first two points here, uh, but the key thing that wasn't so obvious is that it satisfies this inequality that norm of x plus y is bounded above by norm of x plus norm of y, and we proved that using the cauchy schwarz inequality. Now, that inequality, the, fa the fact that the Euclidean norm is indeed a norm, norm of x plus y is bounded above by norm of x plus norm of y, led fairly immediately to a proof of the triangle inequality for the Euclidean metric for the D2 distance. And in much the same way, given an arbitrary norm, you can use it to define a metric on that vector space V. So if V is a vector space over the reals, and if you have a norm on it, you can define a distance function from V cross V to the non-negative reals, by defining the distance between x and y to be the norm of x minus y. Um, so stated as, as a lemma here, so the statement is that this really is a metric space. And one needs to verify the three axioms, and they're both, the, all three of them are straightforward consequences of the three axioms for a norm. Um, so for instance, the proof of the triangle inequality follows from a straightforward substitution in the inequality norm of x plus y less than or equal to norm of x plus norm of y. So I'll leave that as, as that's an easy exercise. Now this is not the case that all metrics um, arise from this construction, certainly not. And in fact, apart from in highly unusual cases, the discrete metric does not arise from a norm. So why is that? Well, all metrics arising from a norm have some additional properties. So they have translation invariance. The distance from x plus z to y plus z is the same as the distance from x to y. And they also have a scalar invariance that the distance from lambda x to lambda y is the absolute value of lambda times the distance from x to y. And this second property will definitely preclude the discrete metric from arising from a norm because Suppose that distance between x and y is 1 in the discrete metric. Well, now look at the distance between 2x and 2y. That can't also be 1, which it would have to be in the discrete metric. So this is a special construction of metrics on vector spaces. Um, conversely, you can show, if you want to, that if you have a metric that is translation invariant, so a metric on a vector space that is translation invariant, um, and satisfies this invariance property with respect to scalars, uh, then it does come from a norm. Um, this is a fairly straightforward exercise. You can define the norm. What, if you take the hint, it's a straightforward exercise. Define the norm of V to just be the distance from V to zero. Then all of the properties of a norm are almost immediate consequences from the axioms of a metric space for, for D and the additional translation invariance and scalar invariance properties. So 
Given a norm, you can construct a metric. Converse isn't true, but it is true if you assume that the metric has some additional invariance properties. Let's look at some examples of this. Well, let's revisit those three examples of metrics on R to the N. As it turns out, they all come from norms. So these are the examples that I looked at in the last lecture. So the D1 distance comes from the L1 norm. So norm of X in L1 is the sum of the absolute values of the components of X. The D infinity distance comes from the L infinity norm. So the L infinity norm of a vector X is the max of the absolute values of the components of X. So it's easy to check that these really are norms. Very straightforward thing to check that they satisfy the axioms of a norm. Um, and essentially, it, by definition, the metric coming from this L1 norm is the, the D1 metric that I introduced in the last lecture. Now, we won't be talking about them anymore in this course, but of great importance in analysis um, and in mathematics generally are the bigger family of norms in which these two norms and also the Euclidean norm, the L2 norm, sit. And that's the family of LP norms. So for actually for any P, um, P greater than or equal to 1 um, and less than infinity, you can define the LP norm of X. It's the sum of the absolute values of the coordinates of X, so absolute value of Xi to the P, take the sum and then all of that to the power 1 over P. Now, it's not obvious that that's a norm. So the, the, the required inequality, that the norm of x plus y is bounded above by norm of x plus norm of y, is certainly not a trivial fact. Um, it's something that you can go and look up if you're interested. And the final thing I've written here sort of explains a little bit some of the notation. Um, the definition I wrote of the LP norm doesn't make sense when P is infinity. Of course, infinity is not a, a number. You can't start raising things to the power infinity and taking infinity's roots. But it is the case that if you take the limit of this LP norm of X as P tends to infinity, then that tends to what I call the L infinity norm of X. And so that's why we call the L infinity norm the L infinity norm, because it does fit naturally into this family um, as a consequence of this last fact that I've written here, that the limit of the LP norm as P tends to infinity is the L infinity norm. So those are all examples on R to the N, which is an, a finite dimensional vector space over R. But there are plenty of vector spaces that are not finite dimensional over R. And I just want to show you some examples that come up. So you can look at sequence spaces. So these are spaces of sequences of real numbers. So we, little l1 is the space of all sequences of real numbers such that the sum of the absolute values is, bound, is finite. Little l2 is the space of sequences such that the sum of the squares of those elements is finite. And then little l infinity is the space of uh, bounded sequences, sequences for which the sum of xn is finite. So those are all real vector spaces. Um, it turns out none of them are finite dimensional spaces, so none of them have a basis of finite size. Um, I shan't prove that here, but that's something that you can, can have a think about. And you can put norms on them. So they come with natural norms. Little l1 can be endowed with the little l1 norm, which is just the sum of the absolute value of the xn's. Uh, little l2 comes with the little l2 norm, sum of the xn squared, all square rooted. And then little l infinity comes with a little l infinity norm. So these are quite important examples, particularly l2, little l2, which is called Hilbert space. So this is really a, a very fundamental object in mathematics. Again, we won't be talking about it very much more in this course. Um, a couple of exercises on it exercises on it on the example sheets.
OK, so that's the end of the third lecture. And that's the end of our initial discussion of examples of metric spaces. OK, this is the fourth lecture of the metric spaces part of A2. And this is the last lecture corresponding to chapter one of the notes, so the last lecture about just sort of introductory properties of metric spaces and examples. So we've looked in the last couple of lectures, we've looked at quite a lot of examples of metric spaces. At the beginning of this lecture, I want to look at a few ways of taking a metric space and producing new ones from it. So probably the most basic way of doing that is to pass to a subspace. So suppose I have a metric space X with a metric D on it, and that Y is a subset of X. Then you can simply restrict the metric D to Y. So formally, that gives you um, a function D from Y cross Y to the real numbers R. Um, and it's just obvious that this inherits all of the properties of metric from um, the fact that it has those same properties on X. So you call this a subspace. So it's a subspace metric. So for instance, if X is the real numbers, you could restrict the usual metric to the interval Y, which is closed 0, 1, for example, or to the rationals, or to the integers. Um, it would be pretty perverse, I think, to uh, define the metric on the integers as the restriction of the um, metric on the real numbers. Uh, the integer is a much more basic object uh, than the real numbers. But still, you can get the integers that way. They are a subspace of the real numbers with the usual metric. So that's one thing. Now, if you have two or more metric spaces, you can also take their product. And there are a few different ways of doing this, um, but it's probably most natural to give the one that results in the product of R with itself, R cross R, being R squared with the usual Euclidean metric. So we'll do that. So suppose I've got two metric spaces, X with a metric DX and Y with a metric DY. Then we're going to define a function D sub X times Y on the product space X times Y. And we define D sub X times Y, the distance between the pair X1, Y1 and the pair X2, Y2, <clears throat> is the square root of the square of the x distance between x1 and x2 and the square of the y distance between y1 and y2. So that's the definition of the metric on x cross y. Now just because I wrote it down doesn't mean that it's a metric. So let me prove in a lemma that indeed d sub x cross y is a metric on the product space x times y. Well, I will leave the positivity properties and symmetry properties as very easy exercises. The real heart of the matter is the triangle inequality. Um, it's not especially hard, but it's a little bit of a mess to write down. So let's have a look at it. So this is what we need to prove. This is just the statement of the triangle inequality. So we need to prove that um, for any choice of x1, x2, x3 and y1, y2, y3, we have this inequality. So the square root of the x distance between x1 and x3 squared plus the y distance between y1 and y3 squared plus the square root of the x distance between x3 and x2 squared plus the y distance between y2 and y3 squared. We need to show that that's at least the square root of the x distance between x1 and x2 squared plus the y distance between y1 and y2 squared. So that is just what the triangle inequality states. Now to manipulate with that is a pain. So let's give some of the quantities here shorter names. So we'll write, we'll introduce a1, a2, a3, and b1, b2, and b3. So a1 is the x distance between x2 and x3. a2 is the x distance between x1 and x3. a3 is the x distance between x1 and x2. And then define b1, b2, and b3 similarly with respect to the y's. So then that triangle inequality, equation inequality one that we want to prove, can now be rewritten in the following more appetizing form. Uh, square root of a2 squared plus b2 squared 
plus square root of a1 squared plus b1 squared is at least square root of a3 squared plus b3 squared. So we'll call this inequality 2, and that's what we want to prove. So what have we got at our disposal? Well, we've got the triangle inequality on x and on y separately. So that gives that a1 plus a2 is at least a3, and b1 plus b2 is at least b3. Now, if you square those two statements and add them together, you get the following. You get a1 squared plus b1 squared plus a2 squared plus b2 squared plus twice a1, a2 plus b1, b2 is at least a3 squared plus b3 squared. And that's actually pretty close to being the square of inequality 2, which is what we're trying to prove. And in fact, all you need to do to um, close the gap is apply the cauchy schwarz inequality. So by cauchy schwarz a1, a2 plus b1, b2 is bounded above by square root of a1 squared plus b1 squared times square root of a2 squared plus b2 squared. And if you combine these two statements, the last two inequalities, what you get is exactly the square of inequality 2, which, as I've stated, is the, the same thing as the triangle inequality for the product metric. So again, it boils down to the cauchy schwarz inequality. So as I hinted, this is not the only way of defining a product metric on x times y. There are different ways of doing it that turn out to be equivalent in a sense that I'll talk a bit more about later. But the reason I've alighted upon this one is that it's quite natural to have, as I said, the product of r cross r being r squared with the familiar Euclidean metric, and that's exactly what this gives. So we've talked a bit about subspaces and about product. And then the final thing to talk about in this first chapter on metric spaces is just a couple of very basic definitions and properties of metric spaces. And then in the next chapter, we'll get into much more serious terrain like uh, continuity and limit. So I want to talk about what a ball is and what, what it means for a space to be bounded. So let's take a metric space X. And remember, I understand that the distance is D, but I'm not explicitly mentioning D. Take a point A in X and let epsilon be greater than zero. Then the open ball of radius epsilon about A is the following set. So we denote it by B of A epsilon, and it's the set of all X in big X, such that the distance from little x to A is less than epsilon. So that's the definition of an open ball. And similarly, we define the closed ball of radius epsilon about A, to, and we write that as B bar of A epsilon. That's defined to be the set of all x in big X, such that the distance from little x to little a is less than or equal to epsilon. So the difference here is between less than and less than or equal to. So those are open and closed balls. Um, quick example, if you've got a set x with the discrete metric, the open ball of radius 1 about a point A contains only the point A. And that's because if you recall what the definition of this discrete metric is, the distance from A to any other point is 1. And so no, none of those other points could be in the open ball of radius 1. But they are all in the closed ball of radius 1. And so you have this curious situation where the open ball of radius 1 is just a point, and the closed ball of radius 1 is the whole space X. So a definition that's somewhat related to this, if we've got a metric space and if we've got a subspace Y in it, then we say that Y is bounded if it's contained in some open ball. So there is an epsilon such that Y is contained in, there's an, there's an epsilon and an A such that Y is contained in the ball B A epsilon. And here, very unusual situation in mass, epsilon need not be tiny. So we could potentially have epsilon be 100 or something here. So, but y is contained in some ball um, centered on some point. So in that case, we say that y is bounded. And let's give a few characterizations of boundedness. So suppose I have a metric space x and a subspace y, subset y of x then the following are equivalent. 
So one, y is bounded. So that's what I just defined. Y is contained in some ball, some open ball. Two, y is contained in some closed ball. And three, if I look at all of the pairwise distances, d of y1, y2 for y1 and y2 in big Y, then this is a bounded subset of the reals. So let's show that these three are equivalent. OK, so the fact that one implies two really is obvious. If y is contained in an open ball, say of radius r, then it's also contained in a closed ball, the closed ball with the same centre and the same radius. Um, two implies three is not difficult. So if y is contained in a closed ball of radius r about a point a, then it's an immediate application of the triangle inequality that the distance between any two points in y is bounded above by twice r. So the distance between y1 and y2 is bounded above by the distance from y1 to a plus the distance from y2 to a. Both of those are at most r. And so the distance from y1 to y2 is bounded by twice r. So finally, I need to show 3 implies 1. So suppose that y satisfies 3. So in other words, there is some number k such that for every pair of elements y1 and y2 in big Y, the distance from y1 to y2 is at most k. Now, y could be empty, but in that case, it's certainly bounded. So suppose it's not empty, and let's take a point A in it. Um, then big Y is certainly contained in the open ball of radius k plus 1 about A. Um, so the distance from any point in Y to A is less than or equal to k and hence less than k plus 1. So there's a simple lemma about equivalent ways of phrasing uh, the notion of boundedness. So that's the end of chapter one of the course in which we introduced the notion of metric space, looked at a number of examples of it, and then discussed some constructions, simple constructions, getting one metric space and giving another one, and then finished by introducing a little bit of nomenclature for some basic objects in metric spaces.